just about every scientific issue gets more complicated the more you look into, into it. And, and that, of course, uh, is certainly the case with the next topic that we're going to uh, approach, and that is genetic modification. And uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Kevin Folta, who comes to us from the University of Florida, where he's a professor of horticulture. Uh, his main interest is actually studying the action of light on plants and uh, how to use light to make fruits and vegetables uh, more flavorful, how to give them a longer shelf life. That's his main area of interest. But uh, he also is uh, driven to educate the public on scientific issues. And one of the issues that he addresses routinely is genetic modification, which of course is controversial, and he has taken uh, some heat for his uh, talks on genetic modification, and he will explain to you uh, why he has become a lightning rod uh, for some of the anti-GMO uh, activists. So uh, Professor Kevin Folta is going to tell us some very, very interesting stories, not only about genetic modification, but about where it can lead when you talk about it. Okay, thank you very much for having me in. Um, you hear that okay? That sounds good, all right, good. I'm gonna avoid the podium. Uh, I just would like to first say thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Schwartz for the uh, invitation to come to this symposium. Uh, thank you very much to um, Emily Shore, wherever she is, for her outstanding uh, organization of the symposium. And thank you so much to uh, Dr. Lauren Trottier for uh, allowing us this forum to be able to discuss science at the public interface. Um, you're much cooler than that Ted guy, whoever that is. So where, where we are is, um, let me go forward here, is uh, I'd like to talk today about this issue of genetically modified food or genetically engineered food as I would prefer to talk about it. Uh, and I'll show you why in a little bit. Uh, I first was, so I was going to just lead right into the talk, but there's been a lot of discussion lately about what's happening with me, um, some, of the issues, some of the questions about my credibility as a speaker in this kind of forum, and so I was asked to give a very detailed disclosure about where funding comes from, where it doesn't come from, what do I do, and so we'll spend the first few minutes on that. Uh, my job is a professor, but also a chairman. I work as the chairman in the Department of Horticultural Sciences in the state of Florida for a land-grant institution meaning that the faculty who work with me take care of the farmers in our state. We don't just take care of uh, students, but farmers and uh, also our citizens. And we have breeding programs that cover strawberries, tomatoes, blueberries, citrus. Um, all of these are faculty in my department. We had, this, we had the country's first organic and sustainable undergraduate program that teaches our students how to use these techniques and these production methods to raise foods with different environmental considerations and high market value for our farmers. We have plants on the space station. We have uh, people like me who work in the area of genomics in order to use the most modern molecular tools to understand how to make things taste better and maybe how to use light to change the way plants taste. So we really um, very diverse faculty. Um, my particular research program, um, I work, still have a laboratory and we still do a lot of cool work. Our main work again is in the light area and currently the only funding my laboratory has is from a half million dollar USDA grant which is to cover the, uh, this particular line of work. Uh, past funding in strawberry genomics has allowed us to not only sequence the strawberry genome in 2010 um, but also understand the genes that are associated with flavors and that's the main driver. So there's a number of different um, national and, uh, and state programs and some uh, funding from strawberry associated companies that have helped us to do this and also many different uh, countries where I've sponsored students to come uh, and postdocs to work in my laboratory. I don't mention Conocet which is another one that should have been on here which is I've had a number of Argentinian fellows and um, also internal grants and things like this. So funding from many diverse sources, zero research funding from Monsanto, Never had, you know, I gotta say it, never had research funding from them. I've had zero collaborations with them on research. They're, they don't care about what I do. They're worried about corn and soybeans. I'm working with fruit. Um, oh, there's a cool picture of some of the research we do. So um, the other thing I do is outreach. 
And this is a big part of what I do. I love that interface with the public. This is something I do many times a week with physicians, with farmers, with scientists. And it's an important part of what I do because uh, just keeping science in the laboratory is not enough. And we need more scientists to do this kind of outreach. And my program is called Talking Biotech. And the main thing I try to do is teach scientists to not be such scientists. I need them to start talking and being teachers. I need them to start talking to a concerned public that's worried about their food and worried about their health. And how do we connect with those people? And that's really been an important emphasis of my program for many years. And over the last 15 years, I've spent a lot of time talking to public audiences about the area of genetic engineering, talking about the good things, the things it doesn't do so well, maybe what's up in the future. All of that participation has brought me a lot of uh, funding from different donors and different, different contributors. I had money from National Science Foundation to build lights that we used in classrooms to talk to kids about light and how light can influence plant growth. Last year, well, about one year ago, um, I, I, was, I met with, I met an a, a employee of the Monsanto company at a conference who said, you're students, everybody does so well, you guys do such great talks. What's the deal? I said, well, we teach communication. We teach them how to talk to the public. And they said, well, this is great. Maybe we have some year-end money and we can sponsor your teaching, your outreach program. And I said, this would be fantastic because it would allow me, and none of this money goes to me, but it allows me to put out coffee and donuts at the workshop. It allows me to cover maybe an extra night in a hotel, you know, things just so that I can do it. And so they gave us $25,000 to the University of Florida that I could use to write against for my costs associated with outreach. Now, when you're doing very um, compelling outreach for many years to talk to people about biotechnology and explain it to them and make it not so scary, you get on the radar screen of many people who really don't want you to do that. And having a connection of dollars to your, research, your outreach program to Monsanto is exactly what they need to make your life quite miserable. And as part of this, oh, and so here, here's uh, some of the things that go on in social media. You know, Monsanto pays for everything. He's just a propagandist. A tiny bit of money compared to what I actually bring into my research program. And Monsanto does not pay for everything I do. Um, they gave a little bit of money to the university. We'll talk about that in a second. So what happened was, is that I was the first of 43 scientists to uh, turn over three years of email to U.S. Right to Know, who's funded by the Organic Consumers Association, an organization that found it very um, disturbing that I was educating people about science. And so what they chose, what they wanted to do was they said, we want to find out how the industry is, is influencing your message. And so we need all your emails. And I turned over 4,600 pages of emails. I was the first to comply. I didn't even look at them myself. I really didn't care because I didn't think there's anything terribly weird in there. Um, but however, when you give somebody who doesn't like you 4,600 pages of email, they can find a way to take a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and build the story they want to tell. Now, it's not the way we work in science, and so I was a little naive about turning them over, but I really did have to be a lot more careful about that. The story they told ended up in the September 5th New York Times, where if you read this, you find Eric Lipton uh, told quite a story. Um, he actually talked about how, you know, um, about how Monsanto funded all of my travel. And here's a graph that shows the travels funded by Monsanto during my career. Um, uh, uh, oh, uh, here's one. Um, I had one travel funded by them last year when a group of farmers in Colorado wanted to learn something about this topic, and they didn't want to listen to the company. So the company called me and said, hey, would you mind doing this? I said, sure, I'll do it, but I don't have any money. And they said, well, we'll cover the cost. So that, that's that. And so all of this really started into this entire um, uh, this column and other fallout that really doesn't represent me accurately. And what's really disappointing about that is that I'm incredibly transparent, I'm proud of my funding record, and I'm excited to show you where the money comes from that allows me to do what I do. And now you can even go, I've spent about many hours, to put together all of this on a page where you can go through the last two years of every seminar, every talk, every um, uh, thing I've written, who paid, how much they paid, how much I was reimbursed, and what you find is that I lost a lot of money personally. I mean, it costs me money to do things because I don't always get reimbursed. Sometimes I lose receipts. And so I lose money by being in science communication, and maybe I get reimbursed if I'm lucky. 
Most things are done for free because that's my job as a land grant scientist. I work for you, or at least those south of the border. I work for them. I work for you too, though. And, and, and so that's my real job. And I'm very transparent about this. And I hope you look here because I really want you to see that I have nothing to hide. I'm the most transparent guy out there. And I want to set a standard so that the anti-GM people will also adopt that same level of transparency. Don't hold your breath. So um, here's what happens. Um, uh, so um, because, I, because I participated in this discussion, I'm uh, Monsanto's brain and Monsanto's shill and Monsanto, Monsanto, Monsanto. Here, um, this, uh, the world's most discredited professor and getting this money and he's a lying whore. Um, I, I, um, I uh, actually, uh, here they tell you that I got the money to promote GMOs, which is nothing further from the truth. Um, then uh, they said here, hilarious, they're putting it on Craigslist in his town this is nuts. It's hilarious. Well, here they had my, my, my deceased mother uh, uh, they put on there on her birthday, so they knew when they were doing this. Um, they put my address. They put the address of my laboratory. There were veiled death threats. There were quite obvious threats. My a boss of my university, uh, when I spoke at Cornell, had to have the uh, FBI terrorist task force involved because of threats against me, because I teach science. And this is where this gets real serious. Um, they took back that money. My university did. They moved that $25,000 away from science outreach, where we teach kids about citrus greening and teach kids about light, and moved that money to a food pantry, which is great. But that's money out of what I used to use for outreach because of the, uh, because, because of the fallout from this. And what's really sad is that not only have uh, journalists defamed a teacher who just wanted to talk about science and share with the public. Now other scientists won't do what I do. They won't go out and talk to the public. And worse, even today, I was supposed to talk to CBC, and they canceled because they said, we got a call that said that we shouldn't hear from you. So not only are scientists not participating in this discussion, and students are being scared away from it, the outlets where we would discuss it are not accepting a scientific message. This is a crisis situation, folks. And this is being brought about by fear and other, other uh, issues which are being catalyzed by this debate around genetic engineering. So that long introduction now will lead to what I would like to present to you today. Um, you know, so, um, well, that, that's very nice. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, Never, never missing a pile to jump onto. Uh, the food babe, Vani Hari, on InfoWars, where you can buy oxygen um, in, a, in a bottle. Uh, and, and then she can sell you an antioxidant on her website. Um, she also has requested all my emails. Uh, and so she is, will be receiving those as well. And I just wanted to mention that there's a book coming out called The Fear Babe, where I've written the foreword. Um, and this will be coming out October 29th. So, and, uh, and this is really the point, is that now we have uh, people who are going after a teacher because I'm costing them money, and I'm just teaching the science. And now I want to walk you through that today, because no matter what you feel about transgenic crops or this idea of genetic engineering, whether you're for it, whether you're against it, whether you're on the fence, I really want you to challenge your thinking on this. And I want to take you to a different place in the way you think about it. Because I think, I, I think about this very differently than most people because I've been studying it since I was a 10-year-old kid who took a book out of the Downers Grove Public Library on recombinant DNA technology. Um, nerd. Um, and, 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 and I've been studying this forever, and I get it. And I want to share this with you so you do too.